happy to see so many of you have survived. Uh, we have an interesting subject this morning that comes down to the da daily living of the things we believe. I've often heard people give very eloquent discussions on principles and ideals, but many of them are still in trouble themselves. They are unable to escape from habit patterns and from the traditional backgrounds from which we have all come in one way or another. I suppose that the present generation is one of the most complicated in the history of humanity. Not only is it complicated because of the rapid advancements in various fields of scientific progress, but it is complicated by a general revolution against tradition. Most people are blaming tradition for the conditions that they are in today. They feel that in some way we were prevented from growing in the very early years of our culture. Actually, however, most of the traditions which have survived have some foundation in facts. And facts do not change easily or readily or quickly. And our general background of tradition is essentially idealistic. This means that a percentage of people had strong convictions and lived by them or tried to. This does not mean that all nations were contrite and honorable it does not follow that all people have ever united in any constructive enterprise. But there was an undercurrent, a foundation of integrities, which, are, which this foundation is, at this time especially, unpleasant to contemplate. We do not want to reestablish the foundations of survival. We do not believe any longer in the golden rule. We talk about it, we write about it, but when it comes in conflict with personal interests, we forget the traditional integrity that is at the basis of our civilization. Nearly every great teacher of the past has brought us a traditional integrity. They have all done their best to call to our attention the realities of values. In most instances, some listened to them. In many cases, they were persecuted and martyred. But out of it all came a lingering stream of ideals that simply refused to die. And these ideals were the integrities upon which modern life has been built. But integrities often interfere with selfishness. They interfere with being exactly as free as we want to be. We were willing to fight and struggle desperately to get physical freedom. And most persons have achieved a considerable degree of it. But this personal freedom has not been brought under the censorship of integrities. We feel that we can do anything we want to, but we do not curb, integrate, or educate the desire structure within ourselves. So today, we are confronted by a complicated situation that is disturbing and frightening millions of human beings. According to some late statistics which we have received, the world this year has increased its population by 82 millions. Looking forward into the future at a situation of this kind is very disturbing because every year where populations increase, sacrifices must be made in order to maintain this increased population. Each individual has to work a little harder, gain a little less, give a little more, and be more patient than he ever was before. 
he is also going to find continual encroachments upon all the materialistic values that he has become accustomed to. The greater the population, the more each individual must give up personal ambitions. If he does not, the entire structure will fall apart. Everyone today is a little bit disturbed, some very much disturbed, by the complete collapse of our social system as we know it, the failure of our political system, the disabilities of our economic structure, and the continual in danger to the personal life of the individual. So out of this comes anxiety, a continually increasing uh, negative approach to circumstances. Today there are probably more warriors than ever before in history. Of course, this is partly due to the fact there are more people than ever before in history. But the percentage of warriors is increasing every day. There's hardly a day go by in which individuals do not come face to face with what to them is solid proof of the failure of their system of life. This is something that is bound to cause anxiety. But we have to also realize that these happenings are not accidents. The problems we face are the problems we have caused. And the fact that they were caused by our ancestors and that we may leave them to our descendants, these do not alter the basic fact that man is the cause of his own trouble. <laughs> Trying to work with this situation tells us very simply that the only cure for the problems that man causes is that man stop causing them. He must in some way change his own approach to existence. Of course, the first thing that comes to mind with this uh, idea is that we must elect someone to do this for us. We must appoint someone to think for us and to have the authority uh, to help other people to see the light and at the same time leave our private interests alone. These must not be disturbed. So we have today a tremendous desire for some heroic personality. We would like to see the skies open and the Holy Trinity take flesh. As this is highly unlikely, we have still other problems and ways of approaching this situation. Admitting that we are living in the day of the great headache, the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we just simply going to have one headache after another as long as we live? Now, headaches due to worry, anxiety, misunderstanding, misinterpretation, antagonisms of all kinds, these headaches, unfortunately, do not stay in the head. They come out into other areas of our lives. This uh, headache that we have, this grand head problem that worries us, uh, is affecting every aspect of society. The worrier is already on the way toward being sick. Now, if worry was what was intended, it would be unlikely that it would cause illness and be destructive to the human being. We must therefore assume that worry is not the answer. Worry is only a means of complicating the difficulty. So the problem of going around, worrying, fretting, stewing, fearing everything that happens, mistrusting everyone, and in a state of perpetual criticism, this apparently is not the answer. The proof of that is that it is solving nothing and making us sick. Therefore, we should begin to think in terms of how to act so that we will not be sick. The solution to the problem lies not only in our fears and anxieties, but in the solution of the causes of these fears and anxieties. It is useless to assume that the rest of humanity will agree with us on any subject. In fact, it is hardly worthwhile trying to convert other people. 
for just as surely as we are trying to convert them, they are determined to convert us. So it just goes on and on and on. The only way we can stop worrying, stop fearing, stop hating, is to put a discipline upon ourselves. We cannot prevent the world from worrying, but we can become detached from the worrying set. We can become self-sufficient to our own needs. This does not mean selfishness. It does not mean that we are not mindful of the problems of other people. It does not mean that we will not do everything possible to assist others in the solution of their problems. But it means that before we help other people, we must find an answer that will work for ourselves. There is really no use in simply sharing the worries. There is no use in trying to find new worries in everything that happens in life. Now, man has been given a faculty that is probably unique in the world of nature. He has memory, a magnificent equipment that enables him to build his own solutions by remembrances of his own life. History is collective memory. Biography is individual memory. An autobiography is the individual remembering the life he himself is living. Now, from the most fundamental and basic experiences of his life, he has been given the equipment to estimate values, weigh all things, and cling to that which is good. In order to do these things, he must shift his point of security. Everyone wants security. Insecurity is the great measure of our time. It is the problem that we are all concerned with. How can we find security? Well, it's obvious that the various patterns we are now following, these are not bringing security. The individual today is trying to find his securities where it is not, where these securities have no factual existence. One of the most basic problems here is the emphasis upon wealth. Most people are still convinced that if they have enough money, they are safe. Of course, uh, it much depends on what they do with the money. If they take it to Las Vegas, they're not safe. (laughs) Also, there are many investments which are very tempting and will lead to loss. But essentially, the individual feels that if his income and his economic status is secure, he has nothing to worry about. Facts are against this conclusion, for I've known a great many wealthy persons, and probably most of you have also known many who are more than comfortably fixed, who are worrying worse than anyone else. They're worrying because their wealth has been destroying their children, breaking down their homes, and making themselves sick. So physical securities are not the answer. Physical security is good if it's available. But as a goal, as an answer to the eternal problem, it is a failure. In the first place, there is no way in which everyone can be rich. And as long as there are various levels of finance, there will be conflict. So money is not the answer to our problem of security. The next possibility seems to be intelligence. Can we, by some means or other, think our way out of this dilemma? Can the mind solve it? Well, the mind has been producing solutions since the dawn of time. But these solutions are interesting, fascinating, very tempting, and can completely uh, uh, take over the life of a person. But these solutions are not solutions. All the mentality that we've had in the world up to the present time has been unable to cope with war, with crime, or with poverty. The mind tries to find answers, but every answer the mind finds and tries to apply comes face to face with obstacles that the mind cannot solve. The truth of the matter is that the mind is an interesting, fascinating bit of equipment 
but it cannot correct the present existing circumstances. Now, the mind has given us a wide area of sciences and philosophies with which to cope with life. The mind has made possible science, but science is not solving anything. Science gives us a cure for some minor ailment, perhaps, or even a major ailment, but in so doing, hands to the world mechanisms which could destroy the entire human race. Science has a very great weakness, and that weakness is the failure of humanitarianism in the scientific program. Science is concerned with knowledge. It is using the mind to advance its own purposes. But when it comes to taking care of the widow and the fatherless, science is not a great success. Other fields of learning, the arts, are corrupted. All of the various elements of mental activity show problems. Philosophy in our generation is virtually non-existent. What we call philosophy is a higher intellectual materialism. Our modern philosophies are based not upon ideals, but upon material institutions. We send our young people to the universities, and they have the minds trained. They come back from the university, and within a few years they're in trouble. Even while they're in school, they may be subjected to narcotics, alcoholism, and other corruptions. Therefore, education has not been able to keep its own campus clean. Therefore, there is some question about it being able to solve the problems of mankind. So individuals look in all directions to try to find some answer to this very pressing problem. This mass of problems arising from something that must have a solution in the individual. Man will never be confronted with a problem he cannot solve. But he may be confronted with problems he will not solve because the solution, solutions are inconvenient. Therefore, we can come now to the next issue in the problem. What is there that the individual can cling to in this great stress of modern living? The first natural answer to this is religion. But religion also is at a very serious disadvantage. Religion presents us with abstract virtues. Uh, religion provides us with a concept of an invisible causal universe beyond our perceptions. It also populates this universe with beings invisible to us. And the whole situation sums up in a very simple thought, namely, that religion deals with things we cannot see, and so-called materialism deals with things we can see. It is perfectly possible to see the house we are building. It is perfectly possible to count the shares of stock that we own. But it is not possible to actually, factually estimate the nature of the spiritual world in which we live. This world is shut from us because we do not possess the extrasensory perceptions necessary to make an invisible spiritual causal life visible and tangible to our common everyday living. This places all the advantage in the hands of the materialist. Whatever he is doing, you can see, he can see. The laboratories produce these experiments. So we have facts gathering all the time, more and more facts and truths gradually disappearing. This means that there is a conflict between invisible principles and visible policies. And as long as this conflict exists, the individual is inevitably over-influenced by the material policies because he can see them, because they are working in his life, because they are directly the causes of his worries. They become the great entanglement, whereas the solution in principles and ideals, this solution remains elusive, intangible, and is greatly overlooked because it does not immediately 
uh, prove itself to our physical perceptions. So with this uh, situation constantly undermining our faith, it is very easy to become more and more addicted to worry and less and less supported by principles which we cannot actually see. The, res the result, of course, has been the gradual rise of a vast materialistic culture. In ancient times, man looking for an answer to things found no answer in the society around him. There was no safety in his own cave, nor was there safety in his relations with those in the caves around him. He was alone, he was struggling against unknown factors, and the material world was as yet an unsolved mystery. Therefore, because he knew very little about the physical universe, he still was able to cling to the spiritual integrities of his tribal beliefs. As he knew more and more about the material world, he became increasingly involved. It became a great mystery, a wonder. It became a challenge. And little by little, attention was focused upon physical circumstances and the possibility of altering them, the possibility of taking your neighbor's cave and adding it to yours, the possibility of accumulating wealth or taking it away from someone else who had accumulated it. All these things came as man's knowledge of material things increased. And little by little, religion was, we will say, transformed from a simple hope, a simple statement of the reality of things above material, material existence. Little by little, religion was theologized. It was theologized in order that it might have a form or a shape a dimension or a proportion that man could experience with his sensory perceptions. He could not understand the magnificent divine universal house, the magnificent universe, which was the symbol of the divine power. So, so in order to make this invisible principle in some way tangible, mortals began to build great cathedrals, temples, shrines, mosques, they began to create visible symbols of the invisible truths. And persons who could not grasp uh, the invisible principles gained gradually a sense of respect, regard, and admiration for the symbols of these principles, the systems of faith that came into the world. The person who could not even for a moment experience the, div the divine presence felt something when he entered the cathedral. He found himself in the midst of a great beauty, a tremendous elevation of concept and consciousness. He found himself surrounded by symbols of holy living and holy thinking. And gradually these symbols brought him to his knees. He became willing to accept the invisible in the symbols which it had projected from itself and which man had fashioned as a means of protecting the worship of the deity which was his hope of salvation. So by degrees, religion became embodied. It took upon itself the shape and proportion of the world in which it functioned. There was one great th philosopher of the past said, there is, there is but one God but he has been worshipped under 72 names. Now the 72 names began to get us into trouble also because people began to believe that each name represented a different belief where the differences were largely those of language and grammar. And actually the same ideal abstract concept of deity was present in all religions. The important point is that gradually the world was filled with sanctuaries of faith. Some still stand, others are ruined. Some more will be built. On and on, a certain type of human being will gain the strength of worship by beholding the houses of his deities, beholding the works of other pious people 
as these works are exemplified in the stained glass windows and the mighty arches and spans of cathedrals, churches, and temples. So we have the interesting phenomenon of man trying to make invisible things visible and achieving to a degree. But this degree soon got him into another difficulty. Uh, these various institutions which he created for the purpose of inwardly experiencing the sublimity of God gradually became involved in various theological complications. And these complications attempted to standardize men's beliefs, to force them to accept certain doctrines or policies regardless of their own internal attitudes or concepts. Gradually, therefore, religion was transformed into theology, and the priests of antiquity became the theologians of later time. These were individuals who were very largely dogmatic. They served dogmatic beliefs. They served certain attitudes. They held certain convictions as inevitable and absolute. And gradually this descended to the time of the uh, universal reformation, so to say, the religious rebellion which brought an end uh, to the medieval world. After the Reformation, religions in Christendom began to break up. More and more individual theologies came into existence. Sect after sect rose, each with its own peculiar concepts and beliefs. And these sects ever since have been locked, to a great degree at least, in an intense competitiveness, an, in an infinite belief that they are right and that therefore others must bend to them. Well, this goes on until another something came along, and that was what we call the Age of Enlightenment, the Age of Humanism. It was then gradually obvious that the public was resenting the dogmatics of th theology and was therefore striving t to liberate itself from the arbitrary doctrines which were supported only by theological institutions. These doctrines gradually came into conflict with human interests and attitudes. As a result of this conflict, we find finally the rise of science and the uh, definite basic antagonism that developed between science and religion in all its forms. These uh, various changes came to the individual and in the 20th century find the individual himself uh, without any solid psychological, religious, spiritual, or even scientific support. He comes into a world that is dominated by millions of persons, each with ideas of their own, which cannot be reconciled with the ideas of anyone else. Therefore, instead of having a solid unity upon which to build something, each individual is under the pressure of a common dissimilarity. Everyone is trying to do his thing in his own way and very often at the expense of other people trying to do their thing. So here we are now in the closing years of the 20th century, and we are here with practically no solid foundation under anything. We are searching for various integrities, and it has been obvious for a long time that science is not going to solve the problem of man's salvation. If it is able to extend the length of life, as it may hope to do, it is only going to give the individual more years in which to be miserable, because it is not giving him any good reason for the life he has. It is not making his life here useful, happy, pleasant, and constructive. It goes on helping him to physically survive, but it does nothing to make his survival important, or to make his survival useful to anyone. The idea that he is going to be remembered by his descendants is a vanity in itself, just as certainly as we do not, at this time at least, have any particular regard for our own ancestors. It is all a problem of floating on the surface of, a, of an unsolved mystery. And in this uh, condition, many persons just simply give up. 
they just see, see no longer any reason for anything. Yet within themselves they have the faculties necessary to discover the reasons for almost everything. But because of the traditional attitudes, because of the limitations of our educational system, and the corruptions of our economic and political structures, the individual has no moral support to try and improve himself. He feels that the only thing he can gain by going against the system is to end up unemployed. He does not find any solution to the needs of his own inner life. There are things he would like to do, but when he is actually given an opportunity to live according to the convictions he can't, claims to have, these convictions soon fall apart. He says he would live better under better circumstances, but as, up to now there have never been any circumstances sufficiently good to make the individual live well. He thinks he's going to. He thinks if his worries are taken from him, he'll be happy. So he has some of them taken from him, and now he's worrying because he hasn't got the worries. That's frightening him. <laughs> he thinks he must be failing in some way if he doesn't realize the seriousness of the situation. All these uh, problems sort of gang up on people. They are not really prepared to handle them. They've had no background of training, the education they have is virtually useful only to make a living, not to make a life. Actually, we need a complete shake-up of the entire system. But when we think of shake-up, we think of anarchy. We think of some despotism taking over, destroying our freedom, and forcing us into a state of discipline of some kind then we realize that this is also motivated by uh, materialistic ambitions. We are not in a position to solve most of these situations. Now, one thing we have to learn to do, and that is to accept the complication as it is. We must stop dramatizing and emotionalizing it. We must simply say, this is it. This is the way it is. And in all probabilities, in most ways, it is going to stay this way for a while. And it's going to probably stay this way as long as we live. Therefore, we are going to be born into confusion. We're going to struggle with it for our period of embodiment. And we're going to leave the confusion behind when we go. We are not going to change all these things instantly. No matter how hard we try, the, we uh, have our troubles in common, but our solutions must be individual. The only way we can face this complex is to gradually work out in ourselves an explanation of it, a reason for it, that is sufficiently strong to enable us to live reasonably well and at the same, same time have a strong living realization of spiritual integrities. Now this sounds a very like a very difficult thing. But after all, this world in which we live is an amphitheater of natural phenomena. We are here in a world in which everything is lawful or unlawful, Everything is cataloged, classified, and controlled. While we cannot, for the moment perhaps, see the hand of God in the things that happen, we do know that there are universal laws that are immutable. We also know that in nature there are principles which prove beyond any doubt that a universal system does exist, and that this system it has the means, the knowledge, the consciousness, the reality, to survive all of man's difficulties and also to transcend man's intentions to destroy the system of which he is a part. This system cannot be destroyed by man. This problem, having been more or less sensed, as we have to sense it, we then can say to ourselves, we're in a mess. Why? How are we going to get out of this mess? How are we going to achieve the things that are necessary? Are we going to achieve it 
uh, by becoming completely discouraged and becoming alcoholics. Are we going to get any solution to anything by narcotics? Are we going to make our world better for ourselves and other people by simply walking out into the wilderness somewhere and leaving everything else behind? Can we fulfill our destiny by taking holy orders and vanishing into a religious retreat? Can we any actually accomplish anything by walking up and down the street with a banner condemning other people? We have all these attitudes, but none of them actually does anything to solve the problems of our lives. Today we have more groups that are in activistic relationships with others that are constantly parading, that are constantly objecting, and yet out of it all comes nothing but a great headache. Why? Because this is not the answer. It is not the way we were intended to do it. Until we get down to facts and realize what is necessary, there will be no answer. And when we get to the point where we appreciate the answer, we realize that all the misery we've had was well worthwhile that it was the only way that nature could educate a wayward creation. That it is the only way that nature can bring back to the prodigal children that it fashioned into realization of its wisdom and its love is to allow these children to get into problems they cannot endure any longer and to discover for once and for all that they cannot solve problems that are greater than themselves. If this begins to sort of trickle into our consciousness, then we begin to have the foundation, not a final solution, but a foundation that will enable us to live the days of our years in a comparative state of acceptance. Not, a, not a, an acceptance of the way things are, Dow, but an acceptance of the necessity that mankind must pass through certain experiences to outgrow his own ignorance. The individual, therefore, can reach a point in which he can live from day to day, observing, reflecting, thinking, feeling, studying, doing everything he possibly can to understand the reason for the situations as they are now. And if he becomes more and more concerned in finding reasons he will gradually rescue his mental and emotional complex from futility, from the belief that everything is wrong, that there's no solution to anything, and that he was born simply to suffer and die. He does not have to have these negative thoughts. What he has to do, instead of giving up in despair, is accepting the challenge of personal change. He must make certain adjustments in himself, he must gradually release his energies from despair and despondency and focus them upon the understanding of life, the understanding of the way things must be and the way they should be, and the way they will be, regardless of what man does. If we can get to understand, therefore, that we are being disciplined, that the individual is being encouraged to correct his own mistakes, and stop making other similar mistakes. He will then perhaps have more energy for solution. There's a lot of work to be done in this world. There is a great need of united effort, but nearly always despondency, neurosis, pessimism, all of these uh, negative attitudes impoverish the resources of the person himself. When he finally centers his mind upon futility, he will find it everywhere. He will become more and more futile in everything that he does. He will become discouraged. He will believe firmly that this world is of no value, and if he gets despondent enough, he may even contemplate suicide. But with all this contemplation and all this negation, nothing has been accomplished except the disintegration of a personal existence. Taking this point as a basis, then, of something to do that is a, a different point of activity, the individual should begin to try to observe the working of universal law in the various occurrences of his life. 
he must begin to see reasons for things which he now regards as merely uh, miseries. He must begin to realize that he lives in a world of lawful procedures and that he must abide by them. Now, on some levels, we're beginning to get a little wiser. But up as to now, it hasn't been considered a general improvement. One of the fields in which we seem to be getting a little smarter, at least, is nutrition. We have discovered, finally, what we should have known always, but which we didn't need to know until we broke the rules. Namely, that nutrition is a very important factor in life, that it cannot be ignored, that the individual who wishes to have better health must concentrate his attention upon learning how to have better health. He must study the problems of nutrition in himself. He must discover his own mistakes due to appetites. He must discover why he cannot do just what he pleases and at the same time maintain bodily health. So here we are coming face to face with facts and we're gradually beginning to face them with more or less conscious intelligence. Now our, out, our mental life is also in constant need of nutritional education. What we take into the mind as a phase of our nutritional problem. If we take in the wrong thoughts, we're going to be just as bad off mentally and physically as we would be if we eat food that is improper to our needs. The individual can be allergic to attitudes, and everyone, more or less, is allergic to negative thinking. It will never help him, and it will almost certainly hurt him. Now, this doesn't mean he won't live through it. He may have negative thoughts all his life and pass the century mark, but he will simply have extended the period of disappointments, disillusionments, and disasters for himself. Therefore, with nutrition, a very fact factual thing, the individual has a mental life that needs to be disciplined and needs to be subject to the laws of mental nutrition. He breaks these laws every day in front of his television, or he breaks them every day in the various activities which he considers essential. He takes in a constant stream of bad food. He takes in food that is not only indigestible, but in many cases it is hopelessly poisonous. He does the same thing mentally and physically. If he takes in contaminated mental food, he is going to be sick. And most of the mental conditions of our society lead to a problem of contaminated thinking. Now, the person doesn't have to take this on. He can live in the midst of it, but he does not have to become contaminated. There's no law that says that it has been absolutely necessary, inevitable, or irrevocable that an individual has to become an alcoholic. There is no reason given by heaven or earth why an alcoholic has to drive a car under the influence of alcohol. These are things we do ourselves, and our worries are just as futile and useless as these other habits. We have no law that says we have to be frightened. We no have no law that t says that we have to have a world that does what we please it to do, or otherwise we will be miserable. There is no law that says we have to be happily married or have pleasant relatives or obedient children. These factors do not exist as inevitable necessities. Therefore, we cannot resent or reject the opposite when it comes along. But every one of these relationships has lessons. Everything has something to learn. We are not only indebted to our families for a great deal of valuable knowledge, but our children are indebted to us for inevitable truths. All these things are common necessities of life. We can reject them. We can allow prejudice and criticism and condemnation to destroy all of the integrities of relationships, 
But this is not because it is necessary. It is because we have chosen to do it that way. We have had our personal conceits rebuked in some way, and we can never forgive the person who did it. Our relatives do not do what we expect them to, therefore we won't speak to them again. It all lies in our own situation. None of the problems that face us in, a, in our personal lives can remain completely unchanged if we determine to change them. There are responsibilities which we may not be able to dispose of, but we can tr transmute them into opportunities. We can do anything we want with the problems of the day if we will place inside of ourself, ourselves a measuring rod, a ruler, by means of which we can measure the things that happen in daily life. One of the uh, situations that we all have to face today is un unemployment and all of the relations to it. We have to sometimes give up many luxuries that we have come to consider to be dis indispensable. Many persons are unable to give up anything without falling apart. And yet these same persons, when they pass on, must give up everything and do nothing more than accept the fact. Everything in life can be understood, reevaluated, and accommodated to if we really wish to make the effort. Therefore, if we are uh, good worriers, as most people are these days, we should take some of these worries and see what we can do about them, to see how we can change our own thinking or our own relation to them, and recognize that a problem is a challenge, not a disaster. Now, we cannot always make a, solve a problem. But the moment we come against a problem we can't solve, this is highly educational in itself. The fact that we can't solve some common human problem may just be a proof of that we are not infallible, which is a discouraging discovery to make, because we wish to assume that whatever is necessary, we know it. Whatever we should be doing, we do it. And to suddenly wake up and find that we are not getting anywhere with our own infallibility can be one of the most important lessons that we will ever learn in this world. It suddenly gives us the opportunity to recognize that what we consider to be the proof of our wisdom is merely perhaps only the pressure of our own egos determining what we are going to do. So we can begin to find out, for instance, that our advice isn't always good. If our advice isn't good, why? Is it because we've had no opportunity to learn? Is it that our own lives have been so instituted that we are giving advice based entirely upon personal experience? What is the reason why our advice is worthless? Our advice is usually worthless because we have not actually learned any of the lessons of life that would make our advice significant. The individual who has suffered much and come through it can, uh, can give advice. The individual who has suffered little and is sorry for himself all his life has very little to contribute to human problems. So it's a matter of gradually gaining uh, an integration within yourself. And this integration begins with one basic conviction, that the universe is right. The things that happen happen because they must happen. And they must happen because the law of cause and effect is immutable. And yet this law never was and never will be a tyrant. The law is not something that is punishing you unjustly or taking away from you things you deserve. The law of cause and effect is reminding you whatever that you want in life that is worthwhile, you have to deserve. You have to earn happiness. You have to earn security, not in the terms of a business venture, but in terms of internal acceptance of value. We all come into this world with really with nothing. We even have a body that for a long time isn't much help to us. 
We live a while, four score years perhaps, if we're lucky, and then we leave this world. And we leave it with nothing at all, except what we have developed within our own consciousness. If there's anything that survives, it's the soul and the inner life enriched by good works and by understanding and insight. Other things are useless. If we die of a broken heart because we can't take physical wealth with us, we are really in a very impoverished condition. And if we leave great wealth to our descendants, we are likely to be doing them a great harm. So nature in its own quiet way can give us the securities we need. Let's look around ourselves for a while and in other people try to see the consequences of attitudes. Try to see who among the people we know is perhaps the most happy. If we know one individual or two or three individuals who out of a good lifetime of years and experience are still strong in faith, who still are able to rise above the emergencies of living, when later years face the future with peace and calm of spirit. What have these people that we do not have? And we generally find out that it is a disposition that is based upon constructive reactions to circumstances. These people are not the ones who never suffered, but these are the persons to whom suffering was a maturing power, power not a rotting one. We will also find that most of the people who are happy in this world are satisfied with little, cherish the things that they do enjoy with great quietude, with patience, with understanding, with gratitude. These people are grateful for small mercies. We are ungrateful with great blessings. Therefore, our lives are not as theirs are as the years go on. We can find in this world a great many persons whose conditions are no better than our own, but whose attitudes are remarkably better. And this gives us the realization that ours can be bettered also. We are not born pessimists. We have to train ourselves to be a pessimist. We have to gradually eliminate our li from our lives everything that is good. And we almost always have to blame someone else for the tragedy because very few people want to accept the fact that they are wrecking their own lives. So out of a little thoughtfulness comes the possibility of the person gaining a stability in this period of stress, which is a thing we are all much concerned with. And we will find ultimately that no change in our outward circumstances will produce this stability. We can move into a smaller house, it may help. Uh, we can move into a larger one which will gratify certain ambitions and bring with it more responsibilities than we can carry. We can do all kinds of physical things trying to find that peace that the world is seeking. But it will still be elusive because everything that is physical is transitory and the only thing that is not transitory in man is his own soul. And this is the thing which he must educate he must release into manifestation, and he must serve with fullness of heart and mind. So if you finally decide to do something about it, begin the cultivation of constructive living and thinking. Let the mind be concerned with something that is not worldly. Now, uh, many things have come along that people have found to be very helpful in the steadying of their emotional lives. Service to other people is a tremendously remedying factor. To forget our own needs, our own wishes, our own desires, to help persons less fortunate than ourselves has one great virtue. It takes our minds off of ourselves. And it is the individual with his mind locked on himself who is in the deepest trouble. Then there are all kinds of constructive attitudes. The individual can begin educating his life. And in most persons, the education of his life will involve and must involve some religious insights. Now, religion is a very personal thing. 
Religion is a relationship between the individual and the divine power behind and within himself. When it is viewed this way, it is called mysticism. For mysticism is the belief in the immediate possibility of direct contact with the divine. It does not require intermediaries. He does not require that the individual follow the concepts or traditions of other persons. It means that through the natural expression of internal integrities, the individual penetrates into the core of himself and receives virtue and refreshment from that power which lies at the root of his own nature. This means, of course, that uh, the calming of the mind is of the greatest importance. The individual who is constantly agitating his thoughts with negative attitudes is not going to have this calmness. But quietude, which was, of course, the basic religious concept of what were called the quietists, which included the Friends and the Quakers and a number of Oriental sects, this quietude is an expression of the term, Be still and know that I am God. When instead of worrying, the stillness helps. Stillness is not an escape from worry. It is an internal realization that there is something deeper, more valuable, more useful, and more beneficial than worrying. It is worrying that is locking us away from our own inner lives. All the criticism and condemnation and irritation, no matter how much we believe it to be deserved, is simply cutting out our own internal experience. The more we fix upon outside problems, the less time and energy we have to release internal strength. So the, uh, one of the simplest things that the worrier can try to do, if he is so minded, is to take on interests that break in on the worry pattern, doing things that are maybe not important physically, but are very important as release of understanding and insight. The studies of arts and crafts, the experience of doing things with the hands, is very, these are very valuable to the person whose mind is troubled all the time. The individual cannot divide his energies equally on two different levels simultaneously. Therefore, if you can't do anything better when the times get pressureful, just sit back quietly and knit. Anything to use a power to separate the person from negative thinking. If you have to keep your mind on something else, this helps. Poetry is of, of a good nature is a great help in these uh, uh, pursuits. A very fine inspirational literature can help. Not necessarily a highly advanced intellectual study of the universe, but simply gentle quietude. It's poems that reach into the heart of things, that bring gentle messages of peace and contrition to the tired person. But whatever it is, gradually educate your mind until you are able to tell it, I want you to see the good in things. I want you to observe progress. Now, in seeing the good in things, we do not want the mind to find good in the things that have never been any good. We do not want the mind to go back to its old habits. To see the good in things for the average person is to realize that an experience is meaningful and that out of the things that happen we grow, and that a, a, a misfortune is not a blight upon us, but a challenge upon our resources. To accept the challenge of growth, we must avoid the tendency to try to escape growth by economic means, or by travel, or by change, which has no direct bearing upon the facts. If you can achieve a certain amount of peace within your own nature, you can then begin to re-educate yourself. It may take some time because you may not be able to just re-educate everything at once because you may have to re-educate your background back three or four generations to get at the root of some of it. Your families have been made up of warriors. Everyone has struggled for something that he either didn't get or lost afterwards 
or perhaps even more often got it and no longer wanted it. These things you have to work out in your own life. In childhood, in education, in marriage, in relationship with life, business, children, and everything, we have been taught to be concerned in the sense of being irritated. We have been taught to be critical. We have been taught to dislike rather than accept the major occurrences of existence. We consider change a disaster when no change can be the worst disaster of all. So with these concepts uh, basically working in us, we must try for the beginning of security, and that is a quiet, prospective relationship with life. When something happens that for the last 50 years has caused us to be angry, now the best thing to do is to take a deep breath, relax, and keep quiet. Instead of answering back and starting an argument that might go far enough to break a home, just say nothing. Very quietly let the thing die without adding anything to it. Try never to put salt into an open wound. Never try to argue faster or better than somebody else. That is how wars are made of people out arguing each other, nations out arguing each other, each one certain that its ideas are the best and that the other one is wrong. So under doubt, be still. And in the being of stillness and in the quietude of a complete detachment, try to understand what is really meant, what is all involved in this entire problem. Who is right? Who is wrong? What is the mean meaning of the occurrence itself? Little by little, if you do it this way, things become uh, symbols of value instead of symbols of loss. By degrees, the individual can gain great insights from the quiet acceptance of life. He can also observe the consequences that come to people who are not self-controlled. He can see how the argument leads to another tragedy. He can see how people walk out on each other over trivia, and why children leave home and get into drift difficulties and perhaps ruin their lives. Now, each person in his own way thinks it's somebody else's fault, that these are ungrateful children, that these are children who do not appreciate values and securities. But the person then says, what securities did I give them? Did I give them three meals a day, send them to school, and start them off? Did I give them any moral or philosophical insight? Did I simply scold them when they didn't do what I expected them to? Or if they had a fault of some kind, did I punish them? Was there anything in my relationship with these children to inspire them to search within themselves for greater values? Did I give them a spiritual foundation of integrities? Did I prove to them through my own conduct that my security was based upon integrity? If all of these, or most of these things were lacking, the mere fact that we supplied them with all the phys physical necessities of life still leaves us with a tremendous unmet responsibility. And this is true in almost every walk of life that we, in, we bring people things, but we do not help them to establish foundations that will endure. Today we are looking, perhaps as not for some time in the past, for better religious values. All around we are finding new groups of people, and old groups also, that are beginning to come back to faith. Now, some of these, uh, in some of these countries where religion is in trouble, particular trouble, the faith itself is a tremendous factor. Even though politically these countries may not be allowed full religious freedoms, they cannot be taken away from the individual's internal life. There is no degree of persecution that can prevent the individual from his internal acceptance of realities. He may not be able to expound them to other people. If he tries to preach them, he may find himself in prison or in worse situation. 
But there is no reason in the world and no power on earth that can prevent the individual from living on a level of personal integrities. He can do whatever is the unpleasant task, but he can do it with an understanding of why. And that out of persecution, out of all of the difficulties that beset him, he is gaining the strength to stand above all of the problems that he has previously considered insurmountable. So we know that it does work. Another thing that is very important in this problem is to maintain some type of regular religious relationship with life. And most of the time we attribute this to church gathering. We think that the individual should join a church, should attend services, and perhaps send children to the Sunday school. But this is, again, a physical solution to a mystical problem. I think every churchgoer should give great thought to how he acts on the six days a week that he doesn't go to church. This is the problem. Is he able to gradually maintain a higher level of religious integrity in his daily happenings? Is he able to live every day of his life some principle that he has learned from his religion? Is he setting an example to other members of his family? Is he doing the things that prove the sincerity of his religious commitment? The commitment that simply is fulfilled by a donation or fulfilled by attendance in public worship is not enough. It is something else entirely. It is the individual's own internal uh, acceptance of a divine principle. Now, unfortunately, most of our principal religions of today do not give adequate training on what constitutes the real objects of religion. Uh, many religions simply tell us that we should fear God, others that we should love God. But both of these terms are extremely uh, abstract. They're very hard to understand. What we all have to understand every day is that religion, all real religion of every denomination, is a way of conduct. And if the conduct is inconsistent with the creed, the situation is out of order. Therefore, religion in all matters is to have a constructive relationship with life. Religion is the power of the individual to see God or good in the occurrences of his daily existence. It is necessary for the person, if he is truly religious, uh, to become very grateful for the privileges that are given to him in life. Instead of constantly beseeching deity to take from him the proper responsibilities which are his own, religion is better a veneration, acceptance, and service of that which is known to be superior. Therefore, gratitude for the divine privileges is more important than fussing over the human emergencies. We are here by a wonderful rule, a law that uh, has gone on for millions of years. We are the product of life that has been unfolding for count counted millennia. We are here because we are unfolding a divine spark within ourselves. Every noble, beautiful, and wonderful deed that we perform is part of a release of the eternal God within us. Every bit of complaint locks that God further into darkness. The individual who does not see God in what is happening to him will not find deity at all. And deity is a presence challenging. It is causing the individual to call upon his spiritual resources. If he believes in peace, religion calls upon him to keep the peace. If he believes in integrities, religion demands that he lives them every day. Now, of course, sometimes it appears to be martyrdom. But for the most part, we can still do a great deal more than we have done. And our first emotion in life should not be 
uh, criticism of other people or criticism of circumstances, but gratitude for the privilege of learning, the privilege of being here to face problems and solve them, the problem and privilege to live above disasters and catastrophes, and finally to recognize the divine power and the infinite love that rules all things. The most, uh, most critics have just forgotten that deity is love. They have forgotten that the things they don't like are practical evidence of divine love. If the, if the divine spirit was not all loving as well as all wise, it would permit individuals to make mistakes on and on through the ages until they completely eliminated themselves. It would enable all that is evil to triumph forever or that the selfishness and littleness of the human being would become the standard of all relationships. This is not true. Actually, that which loveth most is that which chastiseth, that which finds ways to correct mistakes before they become impossible. So as you start out in the day or in the, any part of your life with a negative attitude on things, with a kind of a glum look, and with a quite definite certainty that everything is going to the dogs, it is much better to be quiet and try to say, where is the lesson? Where is the truth in this thing? What is it that I can do to make sure that my faith is stronger than the emergencies of living? How can the individual prove to himself that his inner resources can carry him through any emergency that arises in his life. There are no emergencies really. Sickness, death are not emergencies. That which is an emergency is when an individual makes a bad decision. This is an emergency. It is because he has forgotten the principles upon which his life should be built. All things natural are not emergencies. It is not an emergency that we grow older. It is not an emergency that we have to give up certain privileges and opportunities as years go by. Everything is that as we grow older, we have the right to live according to a longer perspective of experience. We can make decisions that the young have not yet the power to make. But in every part of life, youth, age, all periods, we are living within a pattern of divine purpose. If we can get this thought sort of fixed in our minds, we will not be so given to all the worries and excitements that come along. We are worried today over economics. We always will be and always have been as long as we worship economics. As long as you make the dollar deity, we are going to be out worshiping the golden calf and we will be always in trouble. <coughs> If we make our life built upon uh, achievement in the same sense of ambition, and this ambition causes us to be untrue or unkind or unreasonable, we may attain the ambition and at the same time have a stroke or a coronary, because nature doesn't want it that way. Nature doesn't want the individual to live for ambition alone. He wants the individual to have a little ambition and a great deal of aspiration. This is much better. Aspiration means to become more. Ambition means to accumulate more. And the more we become, the less dependent we become upon uh, accumulation until it is no longer a serious emergency with us. Then there are persons who cannot live or cannot believe they are happy unless they are dominating somebody else. The anyone whom we dominate, we must accept the consequences of our own domination of them. We must take upon ourselves the karma that we have imposed upon other people by trying to live their lives for them. And this is especially true if in trying to live our, their lives, we are simply demanding that they accept our mistakes. Little by little, we have to learn all these principles. They add up to a quite kindly, thoughtful relationship. A relationship in which we are here to become more and more aware of the infinite good in which we exist. A good which we are spoiling and despoiling ourselves. A good which we were forbidding to have happen. 
because of the fact of our personal ambitions and attitudes. As long as the individual lives as a rugged individual, he will end up as a ragged individual. There is no other way. As long as we put a career ahead of everything else and consider success in terms of monopolistic achievements, we are breaking the rules. And if we break the rules long enough, the rules will break us. There is no way in which we can do right and fail. There is no way in which we can do wrong and succeed. In this emergency of the 20th century, ultimately the thing that is going to happen, has to happen, is that the Tower of Babel that we ourselves have built is going to fall down. But this does not mean it will carry us to oblivion in one terrible experience. It simply means that the individual will be faced with restoring or reconstructing a world which he has, de has destroyed or devastated by his own false attitudes. Suppose you have been an alcoholic for 20 years and suddenly decide to get over it. Now it's going to take an awful lot of willpower to do it. It is also going to take considerable personal suffering. And it may be that you'll have to be hospitalized for some, some time to get rid of the pressure of this destructive habit. Now a world, so to say, is an alcoholic. And that can be more literal than we might think because alcoholism is a blight upon the whole surface of the earth. But also alcoholism is a symbol of a way of life. It is a habit-forming symbol of man's selfishness. It is part of a grand pattern in which everything we have done, everything we have thought about, everything we have lived for has been dominated by self-interest. It has been dominated not by the law of what we should do, but the law of what we want to do and will do regardless of consequences. The only part about it that's uncomfortable is the consequences. But they are there, and they always will be there, and no one will ever be able to get rid of them. So we are, uh, if we are in a bad habit, if our world for several thousand years has been doing it wrong, this will never for one moment change the fact that it is wrong. There is no possible way in which we can cultivate so many vices that any one or all of them can become virtues. The, the trouble stays the same. Nothing changes, no matter how much legislation we make, how many rules we make, or how many of our contemporaries make the same mistakes. The mistake is a mistake to infinity. It will never be changed. The only way to get over the mistake is to correct it. Now, with this type of thinking, we can sort of relax a little bit, I think. We can live from day to day trying to be what we were supposed to be, kindly, well-intentioned, humanitarian persons with as much mutual affection for each other as is possible for those who know very little about each other. But to kindliness and fraternity and cooperation, to a constant searching for something that is truly better and realizing that the successful life is a life dedicated to service and not get it dedicated to accumulation. As we go along like that, we can smooth out a lot of this worry, fear, all this hatred, all this uh, struggle, uh, which means people come by the thousands to seek help from, from physicians, mentalists, psychiatrists, and all types of healers, simply because they cannot live with themselves. They have allowed their personal feelings to make them so sick that they are on the verge of a complete psychological disintegration. Now, there's nothing out of those people except their own minds. If they can change their attitudes and their thinking, they can be just as happy as they are now miserable. They can be much wiser also, because they will discover that the causes of misery are their own mistakes. If they stop making the mistakes, they will be happy. Not happy may be in the sense of the of riotous living, not happy in the sense of going out and expending fortunes on luxuries, but happy in a quiet, peaceful relationship with self. A happiness which is the happiness of the normal person, regardless of his economic estate. 
a happiness that comes from good work, from being busy, from doing our share of the world's labor, for doing honest uh, measure for whatever we are remunerated, and doing everything as nearly as we can as we would like to believe that God wants it done. That we will try always to keep not only the laws of man, but the laws behind the laws, the eternal laws that never change. If we can do this, I think we can find a certain amount of strength over whatever is going to happen. What we, do, what we are not aware of, we can't plan for exactly. But if everything we know today is swept away, we lose really nothing. Because actually, one moment of the heart stop and we've lost it all anyway. Therefore, nothing of a material nature is permanent. We, whether we lose it now or on the deathbed makes very little essential difference. The thing, the thing that makes the real difference is whether while we are living we can use things without abusing them, that we can have or not have, and regardless of our material estate, keep faith with principles upon which the world's survival depends. It's always, therefore, no, much use to get all worked up over things. Rather, it is better to prove that we are good Christian people, that we are good religious people, that we are devout in our insights and dedications by living a quiet life and shedding and spreading around us only confidence that whatever person we meet, we will not build up their negative thinking, but will encourage them as far as we can uh, to find the truth behind their own actions. We may not succeed. But at least we will not build up their troubles by adding more negative thinking to theirs. If they have to live only with their own negative thinking, it's bad enough. But if they have to live with a pile of it that we put on them, it's still worse. So the best thing to do is to try always to be peaceful and constructive and find the good in the thing as it is. Find the lesson it is teaching us. Find a way of superior existence which it is pointing to, and that it all accompanies by the very simple fact that the more we serve the ego, the worse off we'll be. But the more we serve the soul that lies within, and which is in the God within us, the more we will come into the peace and happiness of realization and final infinite adjustment to the plan of which we are a part. We find all by peace we find all by quietude and we find nothing but trouble by fear well I guess that's all folks